Well, and welcome to Capital Insight. I'm State Representative Kevin Mannix from Salem, and I'm your host for this show, which is designed to give all of us a little more insight into the doings at our state capitol and some of the personalities involved in state politics. Our guest today is a gentleman who is a newcomer to the political scene in Oregon, but definitely not a newcomer to Oregon. Uh, he's Gordon Smith, a senator from Pendleton. He's serving his first term, but he also has achieved a position already as Republican leader in the Senate. So welcome to Capital Insight. Thank you, Kevin. Pleasure being with you. I know that uh, you had quite a trip getting over here to Salem, uh, what with fog and, and that sort of yeah, thing out Pendleton that, way. It's that time of uh, year where travel is a little uncertain on our part of the state. Well, I appreciate you joining us. We're here. One of the things we like to do is to get a feeling for politicians as people, not mm -hmm. just the, the campaign issues and promises, but a little bit about sure. background. Can you tell us a little bit about where you're from? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I was actually born in Pendleton, Oregon, 1952. Uh, when I was about two years old, my father accepted a position in the U.S. government to be the Assistant Secretary of Agriculture in the Eisenhower administration. And uh, he got involved enough in the Washington scene that uh, he then um, ran a trade association there in D.C. And so I spent a good part of my adolescent period around politics and politicians and my mother is a Udall from Arizona, and uh, Morris and Stuart Udall, who are prominent congressmen and cabinet member in one case to the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. Uh, I was surrounded by both political parties and very much uh, enjoyed dis the discussion of politics around our family dinner table growing up. So we never lost touch with Oregon because we had a family food processing business, and I would go back to with the family every summer uh, to work in what we call PPAC. Um, and interesting, I had kind of always anticipated being in that business, but my father and uncle sold it in 1971. I went on and became an attorney. Uh, I repented of, the, of that, uh, though I think unlike yourself. Um, I saw an opportunity to buy back what had been our family business, and I took that opportunity. Uh, and it's worked out well. And this, this year, Smith Frozen Foods um, will produce about 17% of America's frozen peas and corn. So we've grown the business nicely, and we employ a lot of people. And with a good team of, uh, of management and employees and growers, uh, it's enabled me to pursue what is, <clears throat> on the one hand, a hobby, but uh, becoming more of a my avocation is becoming more of a, a vocation all the time. And um, Let I'm, me take you back a little okay. bit on this, though. I assume you graduated, I will guess, from Pendleton High School? Actually, no. I graduated from a high school in, uh, in Bethesda, Maryland. Were, were your family were back east at that time? That's correct. And uh, we would only come to Oregon during the, you know, June, July, and August. So when, when did you settle back in the Pendleton area? Uh, I bought the business in 1981, and my, I've been there ever since. i uh, married. Uh, Sharon and I have uh, three children. How old are your kids? Uh, they are 13 and uh, 12 and 4. Are they back in Pendleton right yeah, now? Yeah, they're back in Pendleton now, though they came with me last time to the session and enjoyed Salem very much. Had a good experience in the schools, made lots of friends, and so it didn't prove disruptive to them. Are you anticipating, uh, because you are in for four years as a senator and you will be back for the next session, do you expect that you'll have your family back with you in Salem next time? Oh around? yeah, I plan to. I, I didn't get into this to lose my family or to stay away from them. It, it takes a lot of time, as you know, anyway. So having your family there to bring some normalcy to their life and your own life is uh, as far as I'm concerned, the only way to, to go if you care about your family. Well, one of the things you've probably seen, uh, this was, of course, your first session as a, as a new member of the legislature. Uh, it is difficult for those who try to leave their family behind and then rush home every weekend. Uh, it's, um, it's not as bad, perhaps, as being in Congress back in Washington, D.C., right. but it sure puts a strain on the politicians to be away from their, their own family reality check. Well, uh, yeah, I think so. And um, the reality check is a good way to put it. You know, and in, in this process, you tend to be uh, revered probably more than we're entitled to be, and you're called senator or representative, and a lot of people defer to you, and then you come home, and 
you're just old dad to them, and it's nice to have that uh, uh, sense of reality, and, and families can put you in your place quicker than anyone else, and uh, I appreciate that. I would particularly think that a 13-year-old would help you <laughs> keep yeah, in your my, place. <laughs> my daughter, Brittany, is 13, going on 21, and a great kid, and, uh, but uh, she's all of a sudden what I have to think is, is not as uh, dominant in her life as it used to be. <laughs> And that's fine. That's part of growing up. Now, what brought you into the world of politics? You're a successful businessman. You were an attorney for a while. I have to ask you quickly, though, where did you go to law school? I went to, uh, first of all, Brigham Young University undergraduate and Southwestern University in Los Angeles. And uh, from there, I uh, went to New Mexico and was a law clerk to the New Mexico Supreme Court. Um, practiced, uh, fairly general practice in uh, Mesa, Arizona for a year. Uh, was only in law for two years. Those one in the, and I. And you figure by now you've been absolved for, of your yes, sins. Yes. Yeah. I, I always uh, refer to repenting of the practice of law and just fun. But um, I enjoyed the study of law very much, and I find it very helpful in the legislative process to understand the law and how it's its history and how it's written, its impact as it relates to other laws. And so I have no regret in being a lawyer. Well, that would give you a leg up, I would think, over other uh, freshman legislators who come in and they have to kind of learn how the process works and how the laws are put together. Well, if you don't have an appreciation for, you know, the constitutional law especially, it's very difficult, in my opinion, to, to write new law uh, without understanding how it impacts upon our overriding uh, law, which is, of course, our U.S. and state constitution. So uh, it's very helpful. I'd editorialize on that point before we get to the next question by mentioning that it helps too because you can avoid being bamboozled mm -hmm. by people who will come to you and tell you it must be this way, it has to be this way, uh, there's no other alternatives. And you say, well, wait a minute now. You know, I've studied this stuff a little bit and I know a little bit right. about it. That's and right. uh, uh, don't tell me I can't come up with some alternatives, especially when I have, uh, I'll say it, some folks who come to me on, on criminal law issues mm -hmm. and they try to tell me, oh, you can't do that. That'll violate the Constitution. I'll say, wait a minute, I, I know a little something about this after right. 19 years practicing law. That, that's very true. And, and I think another, uh, another part of the perspective the law gives you is to understand that while we are a, a democracy, we're also a republic. We have a judicial branch of government that has tremendous power to check the power of the majority as manifest through whom, those that we elect. Um, the court can uh, rule unconstitutional. The, uh, everything we do, if we overstep basic fundamental bounds. And I think it helps to have that framework when you consider new proposals and new ideas, which can come out of the body politic and very much re reflect a majority view, but may unduly uh, burden minorities in our state. And uh, uh, we have a, a three a three branch government that is uh, very inefficient sometimes, and that's part of the frustration that we have with government generally. Uh, but it was designed to be inefficient. Uh, it was designed to be inefficient to protect us from tyranny, from any group that could gain too much power and uh, subdue any sector of our state, geographically or uh, uh, politically. And so while it, it moves slowly and it is inefficient, it still, it still works and it still provides a, an environment to let everybody survive and prosper if they want to. Well, that reminds me that uh, we Oregonians, uh, we're very proud about the way we do a lot of things, but we need to be sensitive to the, uh, what could be the tyranny of the majority. As a mm -hmm. Catholic, I'm very sensitive mm -hmm. to the fact that in the mid-1920s, Oregonians, uh, through their, uh, their elected representatives and on their own, came together and forbade uh, any education but in the public schools. And right. It was designed to close down the religious schools, mm -hmm. most of which were Catholic schools in sure, this state, sure. and it took a, a court decision to say it's a violation of the religious freedoms of these individuals to tell them that they can't have their kids going to their own church schools. And uh, so that's reminded me that we need to watch out for that kind of a Well, and I think uh, that's why it's important to have a judicial branch of government. It's important to have a legislative branch. It's important to have an executive branch, but not to confer on any of them all power. And uh, so it, 
government is a little bit like an ocean liner trying to turn. The turns are almost imperceptible to the naked eye, but watch it long enough and it's moving. And I think uh, a lot of the frustration with state government right now is that it doesn't respond quickly enough to the, to the mandate about uh, cut government. Uh, it is happening, but it will happen slowly because this process is designed to be slow. I'm going to pause for a moment and mention to our audience that you are with us on Capital Insight. I'm State Representative Kevin Mannix from Salem, and I'm your host for this show. Our guest today is Senator Gordon Smith from Pendleton. <coughs> He's a freshman legislator. He's been through his first session already, however, and he'll be in for another three years. And he is also now the Republican minority leader in the Senate. We're back to uh, talking a little bit here about something I started to get at before, mm -hmm. which was why you decided to get into politics and run for office. But as, as you can see, we're kind of free-flowing here, whatever right. seems to hit us. Well, I, you can probably imagine that growing up with a very political father and a, a very political mother um, uh, and being in the nation's capital a lot of the time, you either like politics or you don't. And I happen to be one of those kids that that really enjoyed the whole process of government. And, and my first job growing up uh, was a volunteer position with the Goldwater campaign, literally mopping and sweeping their floors at their national headquarters in Washington, D.C. I would have been 14 at the time and just, just loved the process. And uh, so I have always uh, been interested in it and had somewhat uh, decided that I would not do it because I really enjoy my work and very much involved in building a business. But the opportunity came along when uh, State Senator Mike Thorne retired uh, to win a seat that uh, though it had an appointed incumbent in there, there was an opportunity to win. And I finally, uh, ironically, it was watching Bill Clinton announce for the presidency, I recognized that he was not much older than I, and he was running for the presidency of the United States. And it occurred to me if I was ever going to do anything, I had a make up my mind once and for all and do it or forget it. I did it, uh, enjoyed the campaign experience, very arduous, difficult, and yet uh, stimulating experience. I uh, wouldn't trade it for anything. Well, coming to Salem for the 1993 legislative session and being sworn in, becoming a new senator, what were some of your early impressions? Uh, that'd be the first phase question I'd ask about that. Well, because I think I understand the process pretty well, I, there weren't a, a lot of big surprises to me. Um, there were disappointments in that it did move. It took too long to get down to voting. Uh, there was so much um, um, jockeying early and in informational sessions that well, I guess they're important, but uh, it seems to me that there was entirely too much time spent getting ready to vote and we could have gotten to the issues quicker. Uh, maybe it's always that way. But uh, I found that a frustrating part of it. Um, I, I would honestly say that um, in the legislative session you experience every human emotion. Uh, the good, the bad, the ugly. You see things of uh, great evidences of great loyalty and treachery and um, <laughs> a living soap opera? <laughs> yes, I mean it is, and you, you see some very interesting people and some, uh, some unusual people, and uh, frankly, um, I guess what I learned from the whole process is that it's a real melting pot and that there needs to be room for everybody, no matter how interesting or how unusual they might be, everybody needs to be represented. At, the table of democracy, and uh, it, you know, again, it's it's good and it's bad and it's wonderful and it's horrible and all of those emotions I experienced. Um, well, let me ask you this about the process. It seems to me that the leadership of the Senate and the leadership of the House in a practical world would sit down and say, "All right, we've identified 20 major issues mm -hmm. that ought to be addressed mm -hmm. this session." And notice I said address, not necessarily resolved, right. not necessarily even voted in favor of any given proposal, but allow them to be addressed, mm -hmm. be felt, to be discussed, and, and, and set us 
a schedule and just say in January we're going to hit these three issues in February and have the bills going back and forth to the Senate and House instead of the shell game where well I'll move my bill if you move your bill mm -hmm. and have a program set up where in say five months time you would expect that a certain number of bills would have continued to have been passed and finalized mm -hmm. and I use the stocking legislation as an example of something that everybody seemed to agree on mm -hmm. But I went through the frustration of all the political jockeying for months and months mm -hmm. when, as far as I was concerned, we could have had a bill out in February rather than I think it was finally in June. Well, you know, we're, we're dealing um, as a Democrat and a Republican, and the fact of the matter is there's probably not a huge amount of difference between you, the way you and I think on a lot of issues, Kevin, and, and yet there is this party agenda which uh, very much sometimes gets in the way of good government. Um, and you're describing what ought to be, but the reality is that partisanship sometimes rules the day, and it's very discouraging. Um, when you have a, one body uh, controlled by one party and the other body controlled by the other, um, th there's going to be these games and posturings. I haven't been there when it's been all one, but I assume it goes a little smoother. When well, actually, I think the 89 session, um, had its contentious moments, but probably because we, both the House and the Senate, and I was there in 89, mm -hmm. uh, were uh, nominally controlled, at least by the Democrats, then uh, there was some effort to, to rally to the party colors on some issues. But there mm -hmm. certainly was a lot of partisanship even then. Even then. Well, I suppose it's, uh, you know, the, the party, parties have their place. They do tend to organize and, uh, the debate and focus the issues. And in a, in a weird way, we need each other to check the excesses of the other. Uh, so it, it has its downsides, but on the other hand, parties do bring a lot to the process. Let me ask you this. The Senate is a, an institution where, I'll be blunt, as far as I was concerned, the Democratic majority has tended to uh, flex its muscle in its own way uh, fairly aggressively and kind of leave the Republicans in the lurch. I think uh, in the House, the Democrats tended to be more accommodating, at least in the 89 session, of the Republican minority. Maybe it's because it was 32-28, it was a close range, and then we saw a shift for 91 and 93. But um, a number of us Democrats still felt that we were participating in the process. We refused to be non-players. Um, looking at the, the, the next round of elections and the next session, mm -hmm. uh, now my Senate Democratic colleagues will insist there will be a Senate Democratic majority. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but assuming for the moment, for purposes of argument, that the Republicans take control of the Senate, I'd say there's also an argument that the Democrats will take control of the House. Um, and you, as a leader of the Republicans in the Senate, will then be challenged, possibly, by working with the Democratic House. Have you thought through how you might work with some of those dynamics? Uh, yes. I, I mean, I. I am not a terribly partisan person. I mean, I can work with Democrats, uh, some Democrats, more easily than I can with some Republicans. Uh, on the other hand, I understand the need to carry the party banner uh, to a point. There, there is, in this coming session, little recourse but to simply balance the books. And um, I think a three-to-one defeat of Measure 1 tells us that's what we have to do. Our citizens are saying, prove to us what the consequences are of Measure 5 are implemented. And then we'll make a, we'll make a decision later. That's going to be very difficult to do, and there's going to be a lot of horse trading just on, on dollars. This is going to be a budget session. There's not going to be a lot else go on. Anybody that has a huge agenda beyond that will get a financial awakening very quickly because there's not going to be money to create new programs. We're simply going to have to cut existing programs. So uh, I think that fin financial exigencies are going to drive this process and, and hopefully cause a lot of the partisanship to go away. Now, I'm not naive. I know that that will still be there. And on the tough issues, budget issues, they're going to pass by the narrowest of margins so that people can electioneer next time on the basis of how people voted. But uh, there's not going to be any dispute in the minds of honest people about what we have to do. And I do think we need to reflect in this next time the will of the people of the state, which is to figure out how to give us a government we're willing to pay for. Um, not easy, but has to be done. Let me pause for a moment and mention to our audience that you're with us on Capital Insight, and I'm your, your host, State Representative Kevin Mannix from Salem. 
If you ever have any questions or concerns or any comments, please feel free to share them with me by writing to Capital Insight, H 395, State Capital, Salem, Oregon, 97310. And I'd, I'd be happy to hear from you. Our guest today is Senator Gordon Smith from Pendleton, having served just about a year now in the Senate out of a four-year term, and he is the Republican leader in the Senate. The Democrats hold a majority in the Senate, so I guess technically we'd call him the minority leader, but I notice minority leaders prefer to be called by their party appellation. We in the House refer to the uh, uh, Democratic leader as such rather than as the minority leader. Anyway, we're chatting a lot about the process here, uh, Gordon, and uh, I'm curious about some substantive issues too, though, where people are demanding some action, and we're getting some inconsistent signals if we look at the practicalities. One signal is we want to get tough on crime. We want to do something about incarcerating felons. I would, I would argue also putting them to work. Right. Um, we want to see more efficacy in state programs and all of that, but when you get around to crime, if you incarcerate felons, it does cost some money. Sure. And yet we're also hearing folks <coughs> saying they don't want to see new taxes. Um, are, are there some ways we can re reprioritize? Have you thought through whether or not we're going to be able to accommodate some of these demands? Well, I think as a practical matter, uh, to be able to expand our correction system is not going to be possible with the existing budget. Uh, but, uh, you know, I wait to be proven wrong. Uh, on the other hand, I'm not going to be one that will uh, have any priority to cut corrections uh, or close prisons. I, I feel very strongly that if you're not going to be tough on crime if you don't have enough uh, bed space. And we don't have that at this point. So to me, the issue of closing prisons is, is a non-starter. Non I'm uh, smiling a little. What if we hit you with an initiative, if it passes in November, that requires that felons serve fixed sentences? And I'm smiling only because I happen to be one of the sponsors of that initiative. That, to me, would be a, a very strong message to the legislature that this is a high priority item with the voters and that there may be a need to change some of the priorities in terms of what we do spend our money on and pump some more money into corrections if that measure passes. Right. Would you be looking to those kinds of votes to see if there's a signal from the voters about oh, changing I, priorities? Yeah, I mean, it will send us a signal as to the priorities that the voters want. And uh, I'm sympathetic to the need to be tough on crime. I think it will be one of the big issues uh, and rightfully so, of the next campaign cycle. Um, uh, on the other hand, everyone needs to understand that the other, it, the other funding, uh, it's higher ed, it's, it's human services, and it's uh, K through 12 public education. So if you're going to add more to corrections, you have to take it away from those. And uh, uh, education in particular took a real big hit last time, and I'm not real excited about doing that again. I, worry about real systemic damage being done to our public school system through additional cuts to education. That leaves you human services and higher ed. Um, human services is a tough budget to cut because there, you know, there's so many attached federal dollars that when you cut, you save one state dollars, you also cost the, the recipient of those dollars perhaps two, three, four federal dollars. Uh, we, we may have no choice but to cut a lot of those uh, human services programs, but there are some very needy people that are dependent upon those and be very difficult to do. We're going to have to do a lot of it. Let's say, let's say a tough on crime measure passes in November if it gets on the ballot, an initiative, and then let's say we're, we're going into session with tight times. Had you considered the option of saying, well, the voters have sent us a message and we're going to have an income tax surcharge devoted only mm -hmm. to funding the additional prison facilities necessary to implement what just passed. I'm throwing that, that's, that's yeah, one you may not have thought about. I'm no, just throwing I, it out. I hadn't you. thought of that. I, I, I know a lot of people are floating around income tax surcharges for every imaginable program right now. If, if this crime thing passes overwhelmingly, I su suppose it, you could logically say that they want this, therefore they're willing to pay for it. I think part of our credibility problem in state government is that we start every session bemoaning the need for more revenue. And uh, I just don't think the electorate is wanting to hear that. And uh, so, you know, if there's a strong mandate for that and, it's, and I have a sense that uh, people would buy it, I guess I have to be open to consider it. 
but I'm not going down there uh, with the idea that the first thing we need to do is crank up a new tax measure. And again, I'm not saying that that's necessarily right. tied, tied in because you could also say that this measure may cost, say, $90 million in the, in the first biennium. Right. Uh, out of a $6.2 billion state budget, maybe there can be restructuring of priorities, something right. you'd have to play with. Um, there's also the question of taking a look, though, at the spending on K through 12 and higher ed. Higher ed took a hit. So did K through 12 this mm -hmm. past session. But looking towards the, the session to come, um, have you considered whether or not during the interim we ought to be uh, reevaluating how the K through 12 tax dollars are spent? Whether or not the state ought to take a more active role in looking at pay structures within uh, the uh, K through 12 system? Well, I honestly believe that the uh, some of the measures that Representative Tiernan is pushing relative to PERS and public employee issues, I believe that those will be on the ballot and I believe they will pass if they make the ballot. Um, and those will be taken care of by the general ele electorate. I don't think we have the ability to deal with those in the legislature because uh, the public employee unions, and I don't criticize them for this, they are very effective players because they are very involved in campaigns. And uh, there are not the votes in the process, in the legislative process, to change their pay, their pay structure. So that's going to be left up to the public to decide whether they want to readdress issues like PERS. Uh, but I, th I think that's what you're leading to. If there are other issues related to economies in K through 12, absolutely we should be looking at them and implementing them as soon as we can. Uh, the, the CATS bill, uh, education for the future, it becomes more controversial all the time as people understand how, it, how it's implemented. Um, and, you know, I think there are many good features of it, but the fact of the matter is the 91 legislature never funded it. And uh, it's been left to us in the midst of a financial crisis, the likes of which this state has never seen before, to fund this experimental new approach to public education. I'm not sure the public support is there for it. A lot of things that we talk to each other about in Salem, such as education reform, the Oregon health care plan, when I go out to my constituents and discuss these with them, their eyes glaze over, and they think it's, well, it's okay, but don't make sure it doesn't apply to me. And to the extent that people do believe these things affect them, they are not interested. Should we re-raise with the uh, public the question as to whether or not they want the uh, property tax limitations on education that they've imposed from Measure 5? and? Propose, I'm just throwing a winger mm -hmm. at you sure. here, a, a constitutional amendment that would allow on a school district by school district basis, the school districts to go to the voters and say, uh, we want you to, to readjust Measure 5 for our school district and allow, say, $10 uh, per $1,000 value rather than $5, which mm -hmm. is the final phase in, and let each school district have its own voters decide for themselves whether or not they will modify Measure 5, which, as you know, passed largely in the Portland metropolitan right. region, yet Im is imposed on the entire state. Right. I think uh, long term, uh, Kevin, that that may be uh, an appropriate thing to do. Uh, but in my opinion right now, it's the wrong thing to do. Again, I use the metaphor of the, the ocean liner turning. Uh, it's not turned that far yet. And I think any attempt to do that at this point, again, evades what is an overwhelming mandate. And to the degree that we ignore that mandate, session after session, uh, we will delay the day when Oregonians are willing to relook at the issue of revenues Let and me, the way we raise taxes. As a final winger, I'll just say maybe we ought to be taking a look down at a series of mini sessions after a short regular session mm -hmm. every six months as this thing sets in to see whether or not people want to reconsider what we're doing to ourselves in education in this state. I've changed my view of the idea of, of biennial sta uh, sessions. I because of the one I went through, I honestly believe Oregonians could better preserve a citizen legislature and have a more competent citizen legislature if we met somewhat like Washington does for constitutionally numbers of limited days on an annual basis so that we are engaged more frequently but for shorter periods of time. Because I think our citizen legislature process with term limits is going to eventually produce a whole group of amateurs such the likes of which we have not seen in this state before. Well, it looks like you and I are going to have an opportunity to try to change some of the amateur politics uh, right. next session. Uh, I've got to wrap it up now since our time is up. 
Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And thank you, members of the audience, for joining us on Capital Insight. We'll see you again next time.